So, uh, thank you to everyone that's here and welcome. Uh, for those of you that don't know about UK UAT, um, I'm the chairman of UK UAT and also the founder. Uh, UK UAT is a cross sectoral cross industry group comprised of various companies, universities, research institutions, and a whole host of kind of interested individuals, entrepreneurs, students, and so on. And we all work together in the sort of pre competitive space to amplify our collective voice and to multiply the impact of our activities. Uh, one example of doing that is that we put together this series of webinars. Uh, I'm going to hand you over to your moderator shortly, but before I do that, just to say that we have done previous webinars um, and you can view those on our UK UAT channel. We will also be dropping into the chat uh, information for where you can put questions for the Q&A session later. Uh, so with all of that said, I will hand you over to your moderator today, who is the UK UAT Communications Director, Cathy. Katya, over to you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here today for this uh, very interesting webinar. Uh, we have with us today Dr. Dylan Banks, uh, who is the co-founder and knowledge director of Liberty Produce. We have as well Dr. Susan McCallum, who is a blueberry researcher um, at James's Hutton Institute. Uh, so today we are going to talk about what uh, TCA will bring us in the future far beyond microgreens. Microgreens and leafy salads are a very interesting and exciting um, area for indoor farming and TCA, but uh, probably we need to look also some other type of uh, crops, for example, soft fruit. And that's why today we have Liberty Produce and uh, James Hutton Institute to talk about that and specifically blueberry. Uh, to begin with, uh, we are going to start with uh, Dylan, and Dylan is going to talk about uh, Liberty Produce and what they are going uh, they are doing this uh, um, uh, period in terms of research and uh, what technology they can provide and what they are doing up north. So, Dylan, over to you. Thank you very much. I'll uh, just share my screen. Thanks, everybody, for your time and and. Um, uh, thank you to the UK UAT team for the invitation. It's a, it's a pleasure to talk to you today and to brief you on some of the work that we've been doing at Liberty and in particular the collaboration that we've been building with the James Hudson Institute. Um, what I want to talk to talk about here just very briefly is, is uh, around some of the work that we've been doing towards looking at what can be achieved beyond uh, the growing of, of microgreens in, in uh, indoor farming. And um, I've, so I've got a few slides I'd like to talk you through and um, look forward to uh, answering some of your questions a, a bit later. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to brief you on is the, the Future Farming Hub, which is our research and development facility that we've built up in, in Dundee that's co-located at the James Hutton Institute. And this uh, is a highly comprehensive um, research capability that is um, intended for us to be able to really get down into understanding the capabilities of where the commercial hardware is uh, in uh, the development of, of, of crop pr uh, processes and growing methodologies, as well as you know, hardware applications at what is considered or what can be a commercial scale of operation. So we're talking about something that's larger than a phytotron and something that's more useful from a phytotron for a, for a crop development purpose. What you're looking at here on the right hand side is uh, is a growing area that we, we've, we've got within the Future Farming Hub. And this is split into to three layers. On the top, we have ebb and flood um, um, dr drainage systems. On the, in the middle layer, you can see there a nutri nu nutrient film technique, NFT, um, which is a, 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 you can see those five channels and um, the plants are in plugs that sit within those channels. And it's on a six degree incline, so uh, nutrients and water can come in at one end and it, and it, uh, and it, and it rolls down to, to the center and it gets watered in that way. And that happens on a continual basis. And then at the, the bottom, you can see the some uh, tubs, that's uh, shallow raft technology, whereby we can float plants on, on uh, 
polystyrene uh, rafts and their roots can go into the water and the nutrients are fed into there as well as air bubbles and, and, and other things that allow for, for the plants to grow. Um, key to the work that we're doing both within the Future Farming Hub and uh, within Liberty more, more generally is to ensure that uh, we're looking to bring together the various aspects of uh, technological control from, from a very holistic perspective. We're, we, we have a, had a lighting product on the market for uh, over a year now, and we're bringing two other products, uh, lighting products to the market in the next six months. In the meantime, we've been developing a control system that not only can control our lighting, but has the interface capability to be able to control other aspects of the farming technology, um, your, your heating and your ventilation, your environmental control. And what we're now looking to, to be able to achieve is, is um, feedback. So the ability to sense not only temperature, but other aspects of, of um, the phenotypical or the you know, what you can observe from from the plants and, and measure it for, you know, through webcams and through other um, sensing capabilities whether it's again through light with some kind of hyperspectral imaging that can might look into the infrared or the ultraviolet or or some other capability that um, allows for interesting um, observations to be made that might be able to provide de decision support tools to, to the growing to improve the capabilities of your crops to make them stronger, to make them healthier, to make them taste better, or to control quality of uh, uh, you know, quality of the crops in terms of yield and nutritional content. And key to a lot of the work that we've been doing, and in particular the ability to do nutritional analysis and and to develop and extend beyond the research and development capabilities that we have within the future farming hub has been the the is is, is our partnership that we've been developing with the james hudson institute H here is a very quick video that i'd just like to show you so you can get a, a better feel than than my words for for what the facility within the james hudson um is is showing stephen mcmahon and media force could this be the answer to feeding ever-growing populations around the world? A new facility at the James Hutton Institute uses the latest technology to grow crops inside shipping containers. The work going on here is seen as vital to help the UK maintain crop requirements for the future. But it could also be used in countries where crops consistently fail. This model, given that it's a container-based system, can be shipped anywhere around the world. It's not reliant on the natural environment at all. It's fully self-contained. We're controlling the environment within it. This mode of farming looks set to be a growth industry. Steve McMenemy, STV News. Thanks for taking the time to look at that. So to, to start to focus on a little bit more of the, the capabilities that we've been developing within, within Liberty, um, lighting has been one of the key areas for us and um, within within this space what we have uh, been looking to achieve is to understand where there are uh, gaps in the market um, and and we've been able to identify some of those w one of those is highlighted in that picture in the bottom right you can see there part of our light fixture fitting and you can see that there's an aluminium extrusion with a blue uh, end cap on the end of it. And into that, you can, you can attach through uh, push fit uh, connectivity and plumbing connectivity, a water cooling system. And so one of the things that's, that's really interesting to understand about LEDs and how LEDs work is that though they're very much more efficient than more traditional lighting systems, whether it's high pressure sodium or, or uh, fluorescent tubing, they're still, not the most you know they're not they're still not so efficient that they don't produce heat and you'd still find maybe 60 to 65 percent sometimes even more of the electricity that gets put into these things is actually turned into heat and so heating can become a real issue in particular if the crops that you want to grow want to be grown a relatively cool temperature, say anything from 18 degrees to 20 to 22 degrees. Left to their own devices, it can get very warm within an indoor growing facility, anything you know, up, up to and above 26 degrees, which will really change the characteristics of the crops. 
And so for us, one of the things that's been fundamental to the success of what we've been able to achieve within, you know, uh, within the, scale, the scale capabilities of the technology is to be able to incorporate things such as that water cooling technology that allows for the high light intensities required to be able to grow you know, high weight and healthy crops at the same time of being able to effectively manage the thermal um, elements of the uh, of the facility, we've also um, and this this technology is is common to both our Folio Nova and our Supernova systems. Um, the Folio Nova has been des designed for um, ev everyday growing of uh, herbs. Um, you can grow edible flowers under that, and you can um, you can. Uh, you can grow a lot of crops, but for some crops, you require both more in terms of, of power. And um, you, here, the supernova can go up to a little bit over a thousand micromoles per meter squared, which is uh, as much as you'd ever want to grow for, for almost any crop. Um, you, you could grow uh, um, cannabis under that crop. You could grow soya under that crop. Um, you can grow almost anything. And within that tech, that technology, the supernova, we've got four different colors of light that, that, can, that can shine upon the plants. We've got a white color and some extra blue, some extra red and some extra far red. And by controlling the, the quantity of the respective amounts of each of those lights, we can tune and do different things to the plants to ensure that they, they can produce um, you know, crops to their fullest potential. And additionally, within the Future Farming Hub facility, we've got, up, we've got 12 channel nutrient delivery. And this is really interesting because normally you might get three or four channel uh, nutrient delivery, but for us, we're super interested in being able to understand what, what can we do in terms of pushing the boundaries of controlling those nutrients and also understanding what other really interesting elements could be or elements and compounds and chemicals and, and um, um, also bio uh, elements can be put into those nutrients to boost the some capabilities or characteristics of the plants and the benefit of those plants. And so we might look at a biostimulant or we might look at um, you know, other mechanisms of inoculants. We could look at um, um, types of fungi. We could look at all sorts of different things that could be put into some of these tube, um, um, in, into some of these tanks and then controlled in a very uh, accurate way with our dosing system and, and pumped around and into and through the nutrients that would go, uh, uh, with, go with the nutrients to the plant roots. And again, then monitor the uptake of, of those things within, within the plants um, additionally to this, we've also been developing a uh, what we're calling a micro nano bubble system, which are tiny, tiny little bubbles that can go into the water and they get carried in that water state uh, as tiny little bubbles all the way through these pipes. And what the bubbles will get to the roots of the plants and from there can serve to provide an extra amount of air for those plants, providing um, additional oxygen to the plants, which can give them uh, a boost in in their ability to grow. The next thing that uh, I'd like to talk about in terms of the future farming hub are, are advanced sensor systems, and we've been we're just starting a program this month of upgrading the sensor capabilities within the facility to make it a world leading um, uh, uh, sensor enabled growing facility with integrated hyperspectral imaging, the ability to measure the, the heights of the crops automatically, highly local uh, temperature measurement, the ability to, to measure the light at the surface of the, the, the crops so that we can get measurements and understanding of, of photosynthetic efficiency and a whole wealth of, of, of other, other important things. All of this is gonna be tied into a, um, a real-time data analytics capability that will allow for us to store that information so that we'll have a reference whereby we can go back and analyze and understand various characteristics of the experiments that we run and then start to perform um, machine learning and potentially even then start to look at mechanisms of artificial intelligence to understand the potential value that those things might be able to op have in the operation and the optimization of a, an integrated vertical farming environment. So um, 
just to start now talking a little bit about some of the things that we do within this facility. Um, we've been, we're super proud of, of um, for instance, the chives that we've been able to grow. And this has been down to, really down to a couple of the things that I've spoken about. To, to grow healthy chives up to, a, up to a, a height of over 15 centimeters, you really need to be able to do that at a temperature that is um, suitable to be able to grow. Um, and a lot of indoor farms suffer from the, um, their, their, their growing temperature of being a little bit too high to be able to get healthy crops of chives uh, uh, um, uh, typically. And you also need to have a light intensity that's high enough to be able to do that. And again, one of the issues, if you, if you don't have an integrated cooling system, is, is that you cannot easily get enough light onto the plants to allow them to grow to the kind of height and to the kind of quality especially the thickness of the leaves that is required to be able to get um, a consistent uh, and, and high quality yield that's good enough for, for the retail environment. So beyond the microgreen, there's all sorts of aspects that we've been looking at. And um, one of the first that we've been, we've been so very excited and, and, and happy to be able to collaborate on is with um, Dr. Susan McCallum, who's going to be talking with you after this. And with Susan, we've identified um, some uh, particular areas where we felt that the, uh, the capabilities of the Future Farming Hub might be able to add value into the work that Susan and the team at the James Hutton were doing. And um, looking to optimize their speed breeding programs is, is, is one of those. And so within the, the Future Farming Hub, we've been able to show that we can reduce the germination time of blueberry plants from 10 weeks to, to three weeks, which in, in of itself has been able to um, provide um, significant benefit to, to both the work that um, the James Hudson are doing. And of course, for us, we're, we're, we're so excited and proud to be able to, to show that, that, that value. So the, uh, the research implications of, of, of what we're doing within the Future Farming Hub, we hope, are to be able to evidence at a commercial scale areas of indoor farming that will be able to become commercial or be able to show the commercial viability of those areas in such a way that that we can then spin off and integrate and build and scale particular business activities either ourselves or or in, in collaboration with others either through licensing or um, uh, through any other appropriate commercial mechanism that will allow for us to push forward this technology and uh, the industry as a whole. And so with that, I'd just like to thank you for the time um, of, of listening to me and, and, and hearing about both Liberty Produce and the work that we've been doing at the Future Farming Hub in partnership with the James Hutton. Uh, and I look forward to uh, speaking with, with you and answering your questions. Thank you, Dylan. That was really good. Thank you very much. Um, so we do have some questions, but probably better to go first uh, with uh, Susan and continue this interesting uh, uh, presentation about blueberries. And then we're going to have the Q&A. Thank you, Susan. How's that? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can oh, hear you. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, yeah. thanks, sorry about that. Um, thanks, Dylan, for that introduction. And thank you to the UK Urban Agritech for the opportunity to talk to you today about some of the soft fruit research that we've been doing in association with Liberty Produce um, and where we think we could be going in the future. So to meet the challenge of feeding a growing population, Breeders and scientists are seeking new ways to increase the genetic gain in crop breeding. So totally controlled environmental agriculture that we've seen already um, in the Liberty Produce there, it allows us to look at speed breeding as a means to shorten the breeding cycle and hopefully increase genetic resources through the rapid generation of our new selections. This is not letting me move forward, okay. It's not letting me, oh, there you go. 
So who we are there at the James Hutton, we're one of the largest research and development institutes for agriculture crops as well as land and water management in Europe. And we're based across Scotland. We have approximately 570 scientists and 165 PhD students. We are trying to lead the way in both scientific innovation and plant breeding. Most of our crops are certainly strategic to Scotland. So we do a lot of research on barley, potatoes, soft fruit, and we've added hops and brassicas onto that list as well. So where we are then, we're, we have a site up in Aberdeen um, located at Craigie Buckler. It covers a lot of aspects of landscape, soil and water conservation, as well as climate change. I'm based in Invergowrie in Dundee, and we've got already around 9,000 square metres of glasshouse facilities. We have a farm up in Angus, Balruddery Farm, which is 170 hectares of arable um, land, and it's looking at sustainable cropping. And between Balruddery and Invergowrie, it's around 270 hectares combined. Uh, we've also got Glen Saw, which has been providing agricultural facilities since 1940s, and it spans over a thousand hectares. So what we do then, we're trying to look at quite a holistic approach. We're interested in crops in terms of protection, improvement and nutritional benefits, the water that we need to grow these crops, as well as drinking and quality. Um, we are very interested in the communities. How do we help the communities in terms of farmers and growers and get the best out of the, the crops that we are producing? And obviously, we can't do any of that without soil. So we're incredibly interested in understanding the physics of chemistry and biology and how it all interacts. We know that, you know, once that chain anywhere along the point breaks, then everything starts to break down. And coming soon to the Institute, we have an advanced plant growth centre that's due through the Tay Cities deal. Um, it's due to, to start construction in the near future, hopefully. And we've also got the International Barley Hub. So we're very aware of what controlled environment can do. And working with Liberty Produce just in this last year has given us real hope and excitement for what we can do together. So my interest then is plant breeding. Uh, at the Institute, we are world leading researchers for our potato science, and we do some um, breeding. We hold the Bank of Land, Race and Wild Potato Collection, as well as the Commonwealth P Potato Collection. So we've got some really vital stocks um, at our Dundee site. We breed black currants. 99% of the UK's production is black currants that came from the Hutton Institute. 50% global market share. Most of that at the moment is for um, Suntory that do Ribena. We have raspberries. 70% UK production came from our stocks. Blackberries, number one variety in Europe, that's through the Loch Ness. Um, Swedes, 40% market share, and blueberries is our more recent um, plant breeding. We've only been breeding blueberries now since 2017. Uh, so hopefully we'll have new varieties and start to corner the market very soon. So the breeding stages as it stands at the moment, and I'm talking specifically about blueberries, that, that's where my interest is. Um, so at the moment, it takes between 10 and 15 years from the time that we do our first crossing to evaluating these seedlings in our own farm um, site to then get them out to our larger scale um, commercial trials, proper grower trials, and then the path to market. So 15 years. So when we're trying to cross and identify germplasm and selections today, we're looking to, to actually have them grown 10, 15 years in advance. So we're always trying to, to keep ourselves in the loop and make sure that the varieties that we're selection, selecting now are likely to hold up to the environmental challenges that they'll face in 10, 15 years. So we try and put your research into this. We're looking at genetic analysis and a lot of that is the parents. We want to make sure that there's a good level of diversity within the parents that we're crossing in the first place. We have some information on molecular markers. So we know if there are a particular pest or, or disease resistance, we can screen early seedlings to make sure that they have that marker if required. And the same with some size and um, fruit quality markers, we can screen these seedlings at an early um, stage to make sure that they've got the traits that we're looking for. But anything else that we can do to make sure that the plants that we are taking to our initial seedling plots in stage three, which tends to be three, maybe even four years from the initial crossing, if we can screen these in a controlled environment, 
and only choose the selections that are likely to hold up into the, the, the actual larger scale trials, we could save ourselves a lot of time, money and heartache. So the timelines that, that I'm interested in, particularly with the, in, in association with TCEA, like Dylan's already shown, it, it's breaking that annual cycle. At the moment in our breeding programmes, we do germination once a year. We do our crosses once a year and we screen our initial very, very small seedlings in the glass house once a year because that's the only time we can do it fitting in with the plant stages in the season. If we can start to tweak that, in a, a controlled environment, then the chances are initially we can be doing at least two sets of germination. We can start to germinate out of the season, which are then frees up our time and it lets us have two lots of seedlings to analyse every year instead of one. If we can hone that even better and start to do early screening within our seedlings, we can potentially do that two or three times in a year. And to me as well, it's trying to speed up the germination. So once we do our initial cross, once I've got that first seedling, it'll be three years at least before I can get any pollen or flowers from that um, seedling to then do subsequent crosses. But if we can break that cycle and perhaps start to, to flower these seedlings after a year, a year and a half, then we can start to increase our generation rate an awful lot quicker. So for me, I mean, when I talk about speed breeding, speed breeding it has been done, and I'll, I'll talk about that a bit further, what groundbreaking work has been done. But this is the way we see the advantages. We think time, because it could potentially cut down the time it's taken us from doing our initial crosses to doing our first screen, to getting our field screens, and being able to, to break the annual cycle. If we can start to, to produce generations in half the time, then potentially we can start having a, a cultivar ready to, to be released in seven or eight years instead of 15. Our biggest cost in the breeding program is field costs. It's all the polytunnels, it's all the valuations of these plants that once they go into the field. And for most of the crosses that we make, once we take all of these seedlings into the, the field, we lose it at least 30% right within the first year because these plants had never really established, they were never going to be strong enough to, to survive within a field environment. If we can start to tweak that and look at that within a controlled environment, then we can then just select the ones that are strong enough to survive in our Scottish um, summers. So it could reduce the cost and the time for us to be able to, to, to get our first field evaluation. Brazilian screening, so this would come down to, again, incorporating our markers as well as looking for some environmental resilience or potentially water resilience if, if they're a bit more drought tolerant. Blueberries are very sensitive to pH. So again, we can potentially screen those within a, a controlled environment to see which ones are a, a bit more robust. Giving us environmental control would be fantastic. I lose so many plants every year just because of the environment that they're grown in within a polytunnel. And when we do our first crosses, we only have one of any one of these seedlings. We don't have any more. So once we lose one that's gone into a field, we never get that back. So if we've got a bit more environmental control and we can keep them in a glass house a little bit longer in a controlled environment to get those plants a little bit better, bigger, before they go into the field, I would hope that we would lose less plants. And what the work we've been doing with, with Liberty is we're not competing in what we are doing. We are not trying to, to cut any corners. It's, it really is collaborative research. It's working alongside what we're already doing now, but it's making it better. It's looking at ways that we can speed up the process and produce the, the most resilient and better quality crops that we can out of the end of it. So there's been a lot of work already looking at light levels and, and Dylan spoke about the, the light levels that they've got within the, um, the, the Liberty um, containers and how they're able to, to manipulate them and control them. And by extending the duration that a plant is exposed to light every day or targeting the specific wavelengths, you can see on, on this picture, it can promote either flowering or vegetative growth. And that then allows it to, to reduce the generation time under the right favourable conditions. We can give it the right levels of light at an early seedling to promote vigorous growth. So if the plant puts in a lot of effort, it gets really nice root system, a lot of vigorous growth, then you can change that wavelength, you can change the light it gets, and it can then it promote the flowering. 
And if we can promote the flowering early and get that pollen, we can then get a new generation started really quickly. So that to me is, is a really important bonus that we can get within the, the controlled environment. So I mentioned the progress made to date. There has been groundbreaking work, research that's paved the way for us to be looking at this in soft fruit. It was first developed by NASA, who were looking to, to grow various crops up in the space station. The, the Hickey Group in Australia have taken this on and, and they have you know, made the, 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 the whole process really smooth with the John Innes Centre. They've done incredible work with wheat, barley, oats, brassica, peas, and the, they've really made a difference and produced protocols to allow other people to do the same thing. And what we would like to do alongside Liberty is to try and develop protocols for the soft fruit. If we can adapt and perfect the light and the temperature regimes, then we can increase the generation rates, we can increase the genetic diversity in the crops that we are producing, and hopefully we can produce better crops for the, the UK environment. For perennial crops like soft fruit, the major driver determining the breeding cycle is the length of the juvenile period. So that's something that will take a lot of work to tweak and to make sure that we are targeting that properly. The, the juven juvenility is the ex extended period after germination where vegetative development is there and the flowering is repressed, even under the favourable conditions. And it does that to make sure that the plant is not taking vital resources away from the rooting and from the vegetative growth to produce seed and, and, and fruit if it's not likely to be viable. So in um, blueberries, it's at least two years from your initial seedling before you'll get any flowers. It's three to five years in cherries, and it goes all the way up to 15 years if you're trying to grow avocados. So anybody that's at home looking at their avocados or they've planted their own lemon and limes, I think they take about 10 years before that you can actually break that cycle and allow them to, to flower. So manipulating the light and controlling that a little bit better, you can force the, the plant, if you will, into early vegetative growth by giving them that extra periods of light. And then you can switch that wavelength or switch the day length that they're subjected to, which will then encourage an awful lot of flowering. And that's the, the protocols that we're trying to develop with, um, with, with Liberty at the moment. And varying the degrees of, of critical day length across soft fruit will be difficult because, you know, we have various rates of short day and long day um, fruit. So it's not going to be quite as simple as what the, the work that we've already seen in, in barley and wheat, where you can go from 22 hours of daylight and two hours of dark, and you can produce you know, six generations a year. It's not going to be that simple with the soft fruit, because for the most part in blueberries, they prefer a short day to initiate flowering. But what we can do is give them the long days to, to get them to grow as big, as vigorous and as bushy as they can to then shorten that period to, to encourage them to flower but there'll be a bigger bush quicker which will allow, allow them to produce more flowers and hopefully fruit an awful lot quicker and with that I, I'm just like to thank everybody that's involved in the research at the, the Hutton Institute as well as the, the breeding program um, that are funding the work that we are doing currently and uh, like Dylan if anybody's got any questions I'd be more than happy to try and answer them thank you very much Susan, that was really interesting. Thank you very much for that. Uh, even, you know, my personal uh, research interest is around the soft fruit. So um, it is really exciting to, to see like this uh, speed breeding actually happening. Um, so we have a few questions from audience and I do have some questions I would like to ask Dylan first and then Susan. So Dylan, you um, talked very nicely about the technology you provide and the hydroponic technology as well, the lighting, Liberty Produce uh, has uh, using up there, at, up north. So for me, it's really interesting to know whether your lighting uh, modules, the ones that you have available on the market currently, can customers adjust spectra? So if they want to do custom research, can they do with these modules you provide? So the the, the lights that, are in, that you saw within that facility there, they are single channel lights, um, but the supernova lights that we have have a adjustable uh, channel. They're, they are at the moment four channel, but they have the ability to be up to eight channel. Um, and they can, that 
can be adjusted either manually or through uh, an app. We have a, an app connection capability, so you can effectively log into the lights to control them. And you can use that to control banks of lights, so you can do it, change them all in one go, or, or you can change individually, and you can then set growing regimes as you would, as you would wish uh, through that. At the moment, all of that has to be done within the app itself, but we're developing a, a web interface platform so that you can control um, those aspects. And then we're looking to tie that into the, to the data recording aspects as well. So we can have fully integrated mm -hmm. database capability where we're mapping the growing uh, regime and the, the lighting conditions with the, with the outputs of the, the plants. It's really interesting. Thank you very much. Also, you referred uh, during your presentation on the different nutrients and different combinations of uh, biostimulants and other um, compounds that you're adding into the nutrient feed. Um, I'm really interested to know what was the most innovative and groundbreaking findings you had so far with these additives and this nutrients uh, management. So um, some of the specifics, it's difficult to us to talk about because we're yeah, under confidence okay. with the partners that we work with, but um, to give you a, an idea, we've been we, we've been certainly within the the literature. There's there's a good body of evidence that, for instance, selenium can be added into the nutrient mix, and you get excellent uptake into the plant uh, matter from that. And so, as an indicator, there are um, there are some really interesting aspects that can come around from boosting the capabilities of the plants to actually become superfoods by, by putting additional uh, nutrients or, or minerals in, into the plants through the feed. And that becomes economically viable because um, in, in, in the open field, simply you couldn't afford to, to, to cast too, too much of that material or the compound on, on, onto the fields. But in yeah. this environment, you can recycle it. And so it becomes economically mm. um, uh, achievable. Viable, yeah. Good, thank you very much. We have also some questions from audience. Um, so someone anonymous asking uh, for 1000 micromole per meter per square uh, per second, uh, at what distance ah, is so, that? Yeah, so um, the, the, uh, the measurements that we've put here uh, are all um, at 30 centimeters from from the plants so the fixture spacing that we have there are with the strips of light being at 25 centimeters um, apart and so from 30 centimeters uh, is where we make our measurements that seems to be a relatively standard approach which is why we've got, gone at that point um, but we have the capability to um, to, to tune and to adjust that so for some customers um, who have more or, or, or a higher or lower uh, requirement. We're fortunate in that it, to some respects, the extrusion elements that we've got within here are over, over engineered, which gives us a high degree of flexibility over heat, heat dissipation, both passively and actively with the water cooling. Okay, good, thank you. Um, we have also a question from uh, Matt Jones. Matt, would you like to ask the question uh, yourself? Oh, sure, I can do. Yeah. Video as well. Hi, Dylan. Um, it's a nice talk and um, thanks for the intro as well. Um, I guess you ha ha had me thinking when you were talking about the nutrient control you've got, just how fine grained is that nutrient control? And can you measure that alongside the, the light intensity and light quality that you're using? I suspect you're going to tell me you, the lights aren't ready yet, but I wonder what the interplay would be between the nutrients and the light quality and whether you've explored that. So that's exactly the, the direction of travel for us within, within, within the facility here. To give you a, a super quick uh, timeline history, um, so the, the facility was formally opened um, a year ago. Uh, we went through a commissioning process at that point and then started the, the very first trials um, in, in February, March of last year. Uh, we then started to look at the work that we've been doing uh, with, with Susan and the James Hutton. We've got four or five experiments running through the facility, typically in parallel at the moment. And um, we're now going through an upgrade capability. Um, we're, we're replacing um, uh, some of the lights with the supernova lights, which will give us the full, well, the multi-spectral control. 
Um, and we're also building in the, the sensor capability, which will give us that hyperspectral imaging um, capability, as well as the ability for us to measure um, um, micromoles and, and uh, what have you at, at the canopy, tying all of that in with other measurements that we'll be able to do. And of course, with the James Hutton Institute on our doorstep, we've got access to, to the full suite of, of testing capability for nutritional analysis, or frankly, any, any other uh, capability that we would we could imagine that we would need. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And we have uh, another question from Peter Lane, and is why don't you use a DC bus bar system, which would, amongst other things, reduce heat produced by EC DC conversion? Yeah, I see that. Um, uh, yeah, yeah um, so that's it's it, uh, it's a it's a really good question, um, and um, absolutely, particularly when you move to 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 scale. There is um, there are significant savings that can be made um, with, by by optimizing the the state of the electricity that you're that you're using in terms of where you're moving that around your facility, and the work that uh, Intelligent Growth Solutions IGS have done um, that is also co-located uh, on the site at the James Hudson Institute is has been really um, pushing the boundaries and very innovative innovative in this space. For us, within this facility and within the, the work that we do and, the, and, and for the products that we deploy at the moment, we are using capabilities that are um, um, th that we can be fully assured of, of being compliant for electrical safety standards as they sit around the world. And so for most of the installations that we're using, um, the driver capabilities that we have implemented um, meet that requirement. And so that's the reason why um, that we're using, um, well, we have one driver for four, for four lighting modules, um, one driver per, per fixture. So that's a, it is an improvement on, on many of the um, existing uh, 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 lighting products at, at this level where drivers will often be integrated within the modules, um, but is a step, is, is a step uh, behind where you can be. Having said that, certainly some of the customers that we're working with um, have um, desires for low voltage um, or, or high current to low voltage um, systems. And in those, in those implementations, you can disregard the driver and power from a, a central uh, power bank. So absolutely, the, the fixtures that we've designed have the ability to be powered in that way. And some of the installations that, um, that, that, that uh, um, we've been um, looking at how exactly have that option. Good, thank you, Dylan. And um, thank you very much for that. Now we have some questions for Susan, if that's all right. So Susan, I have some questions and then the audience. Um, so this speed breeding, as far as I understand, is basically when we incorporate uh, control environment agriculture, in your case, DCA. And what I'm really interested to know is, are there any other crops, you refer to some um, stable crops that they have been uh, speed breeded, but are there any other crops that other institutions like in UK or internationally, they're working currently with this speeding, speed breeding? Well, at the moment, it certainly seems to be on a lot of crops like the, the barleys and the oats and the, the things that are able to speed up the, the generation time very quickly. There is one paper that I came across just recently where they were looking at apples. So, you know, they're also looking to see whether they can implement this type of technology within tree species which I think would be fantastic for, for that um, kind of research, because obviously the, you know, developing new tree species takes even longer than it does for, um, for blueberries. And I think avocado, as I'd mentioned, you know, it's 15 years before you can start to get any fruiting material from an avocado. So I, I believe that they're starting to look to see whether they can start to speed that up by manipulating the light and the temperature. Thank you. And uh, then uh, another question we have here, which is, um, are there any synergies or collaboration with IGS? 
Yes, uh, absolutely. I mean, like Dylan said, they, they're also on site mm -hmm. here now. So we've done a lot of work, not specifically within the soft fruit group, but within the, the James Hutton, there's been a lot of work um, going on within the, the IGS. I, I think there was a few projects looking at strawberry um, propagation mm -hmm. and growing within the IGS. So yeah, absolutely. Good, thanks. Um, now, you both Dylan and you, you explained this speed breeding that can last uh, from 10 to 25 years. And uh, I understand that probably what you're doing is at the very beginning of the process, not at the very end, um, which is uh, very, very interesting. Uh, how important is uh, the variety selection? And uh, are you, have you already done that or are you in the process of doing that? And this is this a stage where uh, TCA can help? Absolutely. I, I think, I mean, like, like you said, we're definitely at the, the very early stages of, of mm. looking at how we can use the light and temperature to, to manipulate um, and speed up the, the plant growth and development. Variety will be incredibly important. And I think that's been shown in some of the crops that, that the speed breeding work has already been done with, that some varieties or some species will amend itself to a manipulation of light or extended periods of light an awful lot better than others will. So when we start to really get you know, a lot of material within the, 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 the facility, we'll definitely have to look at a whole range of, of varieties that we can get our hands on, as well as hopefully some of our advanced selections and just then look to see how they will react under light because we will expect that different varieties will react differently. It's the same when we try to propagate. When it comes to propagating our material, some material propagate very easily and others, you know, it, it's very difficult and you've really got to manipulate the recipe. So we expect it to be the same in, in the TCA. Okay, very interesting. Um, another question is, uh, my question is still that, um, in terms of uh, substrate, we saw from Dylan's uh, picture and video that uh, there is an ability to use NFT, but also you can use other you know, hydroponic principles. Are you using substrate with the trials you are currently doing, or you are going into more hydroponic systems? Um, oh. For Susan mainly, but Susan, yeah. Dylan, if you want, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, at the moment with, with Liberty, we're just looking at the hydroponic side of things. Um, from the, the blueberry breeding, the, the work that I've done previously, we have looked at a, a whole range of different substrates and, and there are a lot of very nice um, blueberry specific substrates that help with mm -hmm. growth. Uh, once we start to, to look at potentially you know, growing larger plants within a facility that's controlled environment, then we will likely to be look, have to look at the, the substrate as well. I'm not sure how well we'd be able to do crossing of, of you know, two or three year old plants if it's all just in hydroponics. I would expect yeah. that that'll need to be in substrate. So that will be something that we'll look at at a later stage, yeah. absolutely. Good, thank you. Um, now some uh, questions from the audience. Um, the first one is, could these speed breeding techniques be applied to other crops in the future? If so, which crops would we do sooner and which later? Yeah, I have a very good, very good question. I mean, I, I think that it has the potential to be used in, in any crops. I mean, obviously, the, the issue that we have when we're growing plants like blueberries or when we're talking about tree species like, like cherries, it's the size. So, you know, we have to make sure that when we are growing them within a controlled environment that you have the space if you want to, to really be able to grow these trees to, to any kind of size. Um, high value crops like uh, soft fruit, and particularly as I mentioned strawberries, and I think strawberries would be incredibly uh, adapted to growth within a controlled environment. And strawberry is one of the biggest selling crops you know, in soft fruit. It's mm. worth billions of, of pounds. I think it's 700 million into to the UK economy soft fruit. So I think strawberry would definitely be one of the, the top ones that yeah. would start to be grown in there. And I think it would work really well. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question we have here is, um, could growing and or developing more crops varieties in CA make an impact on issues like land sparing, biodiversity, climate mitigation and so on? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, I mentioned before just that the genetic diversity within soft fruit crops and, and, and crops in general, um, we've seen devastating consequences of a loss of genetic diversity within a, a number of crops over the last several decades. 
you know, in the 1970s, there was a southern a corn blight. 85% of the corn that was grown in the USA was just one variety, one species. And a, a, a bacteria, I think it was actually a fungal infection, came along and wiped out all of that corn because once one plant is susceptible, yeah. it knocks out everything. And it cost the industry about a billion, a billion dollars. In the 1950s, I think it was one of the most commonly grown bananas was completely wiped out by Panama disease. And, you know, again, once one plant comes down, everything was knocked out. And it took several years before they were able to develop another variety that came close and um, the, the banana that we grow today, the, the, the Cavendish, I think it's called. And there's now a new Panama disease. And th this Cavendish banana, 99% of the exported bananas are this one species. So once you get this knocked out, it takes an awful lot of time and effort to halt you know, the, the spread of a, of, a, of a disease and to generate new varieties. So being able to have something like a controlled environment where you can test these new species and you can continually develop in the new species, I think it's incredibly important. The breeding programs have been focusing on size and yield and they've lost that resilience and they've lost some of the flavor. And I think they need to go back to that. And I think a controlled environment where they can start speeding up the generations so they can start to look at crosses with, with older species that have some sort of disease tolerance, I think it will make the, the diversity of what we can grow and where we can grow it an awful lot better for and, and make us more future proof. That's good. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, we have another question, and that is regarding overcoming juvenility in perennial crops, what are the underlying mechanisms controlling this? Could PGRs or stress treatments be of use? You did say so that you're using different lights and this type of things, but probably you can, uh, you know, um, talk a bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, th there are a lot of the genetic pathways that are involved in flowering have been well established and they, they seem to find that in a lot of flowering crops, these are very well conserved. So a, a lot of these genes are known. So there are certainly scope to be able to study these genes and the pathways to be able to understand and potentially screen for those that have you know, higher levels or, or better expression of particular flowering genes in order to break that juvenility. Um, but I, I certainly think that by using the light levels and the temperature, we can speed it up slightly. I mean, I, I don't think you can go from, you know, taking the avocado, for example, you're not going to be able to go from 15 years and cut it down to three years. You might be able to cut a couple of years off that by, you know, getting the plant to, to become very vegetative. And I think if you can produce a very vigorous plant at an early stage, then it has more resources it, it, is, it has a stronger ability and a resilience to then be able to put the effort into flowering. Because when, yeah. when plants flower, they're having to lose a lot of vital resources to do that. And that's why this juvenility is so important at an early stage. It makes sure that the plant is suitable to grow in the environment that it's in, to make sure it becomes to a, a big enough size to compete environmentally before it then puts the effort out and flowers it in, into seeds. So I, I definitely think that by studying the, the genetic pathway, and it is very well known, we can start to screen earlier to potentially select parents that have you know, a better adaptability to these flowering genes and then use them within the, the different lighting regimes to get them vigorous and get a, a very big plant quicker and then change that light levels to encourage it to flower. Yeah, yeah, I can see that with the strawberries or the trials we're doing. And uh, exactly that, what you said, if you don't have vegetative growth in a, you know, good level, then you have problems, yeah. Problems uh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, yeah. Com commercially at the moment with blueberries, a lot of the, the blueberry growers, when they get a plant that's two years old that, that does initially flower, they take the, yeah. the, all the flowers off. You know, they spend a lot of time yeah. and effort taking all these flowers off and that forces the plant to put its reserves into the vegetative growth in, in the roots. And if you've got good roots and you've got a healthy vegetative growth, then the following year, the flowering can become even bigger and better and the fruit, the fruit area is better. So if we can start that off by getting a really vigorous plant using the, the light and the extended photo period, then further down the line, I think that'll have a knock-on effect for the flowering. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we have one question uh, probably for Dylan or both. Um, when will we see next um, expansion of your facilities? Um, 
our plan at the moment, and um, this is uh, dependent on a few external factors. Uh, oh, sorry, you cannot see my video. Um, our plan at the moment is to begin expansion plans to triple the, the size in, in April. Um, we will uh, um, we'll be out, we'll be confirming whether we can do that over the next um, six weeks or so. Good. And um, I have one last question for both of you. I think that is also the title of the webinar. So where is the industry going beyond microgreens and leafy salads? Where do you think it's going? Should I go first? Yeah, you can. <laughs> well, I mean, the, 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 I think the key challenges for the industry at the moment are, to, are to now to look to address the ability to, to grow um, uh, quality and quantity at a price point that, uh, um, that, that is competitive into the marketplace and, and also to look at the energy consumption of the, the systems. And the, the, the ways I think that the industry needs to go about doing this is to, to take a, an even larger holistic point of view, understand how energy management system works and interface with them. Uh, and all energy providers and interface with them. And ultimately, if those challenges can be addressed, that the energy consumption elements can be addressed and the, the quality control, uh, the light intensity, the nutrient control systems can be addressed, then, then why not grow any, any produce that, um, you know, as long as it can fit within the facility, uh, can grow there. Certainly, we're looking at a whole range of um, high value uh, crops at this moment that are, that are beyond microgreens. And you know, the market is already at the point whereby niche products and niche requirements are defining a commercial viability in, in food produce and outside of food produce for, for all sorts of reasons, um, not just price, but in particular where um, issues to do with growing outside introduces elements that might improve, uh, d d cause deterioration or, or might um, affect um, you know, bacterial load or, or some other effect within those plants. And identifying those uh, areas and, and then um, you know, evidencing that, that you can grow within those areas and developing systems that can, can ensure that you can grow those areas are, is key to what we're, what we're looking to achieve. Um, I mean, well, for instance, you know, the, the excellent work that you've been doing with strawberries you know, um, to, you know, is, is testament to is testament to that. So yeah. Thanks, Susan. Would you like to add anything? Yeah, I completely agree. And I think the only thing I'd add to that as well, it's water use efficiency. It's been able to use uh, and problems that we have an awful lot of growing regimes. It's the availability of pesticides and, you know, being able to cut that down. If we're able to utilise the, the nutrients and the water more efficiently to get into the plants, then, you know, I don't see any system that wouldn't lend itself well to, to a controlled environment. I think it's cutting down on waste and it's been able to grow plants that are really fit for purpose and be able to withstand the environment that's thrown at. And I think controlled environment really gives us the chance to, to throw a lot of various environmental factors at the plants before we take them outside. And then we're selecting only the best of the best to then grow them specifically for the environment that they're likely to, to see their life in. So absolutely, I think the future is, is very bright for, for the controlled environment. Yeah, thank you. I agree. I think uh, it's much more beyond microgreens and leaf salads. We can see uh, the exciting work you are doing with breeding and that breeding can apply to most plants. And uh, of course, strawberries and potentially other things in the future. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I believe that uh, that is close to the end now. We don't have any other question. And uh, both Susan and Dylan responded to all my questions uh, very nicely. Thank you very much for that. So um, if you would like to view the webinar again, this is going to be available on our website and it's going to be recirculated within uh, the membership of UK, UAT and also social media. But if you want to hear more about UK UAT, of course, follow us on LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter, and of course, our website. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.